Now the one big difference in planting oak tree versus anything else we grow is the fertilizer. What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having an awesome day. We got a little bit of a cool off today with some wind. Finally got some rain yesterday which was much needed. It had been a while, things had gotten kind of dry and it was super, super hot last week. So I figured it was a good time to talk about watering today, how often we water certain plants, especially when we go through a dry spell. What is our watering frequency? How long are we running our water? All that kind of good stuff. And then we need to thin some of these peas back here. They came up really well the second time. I told y'all about that on a previous video. We need to get in there and thin those out a little bit. And we've got some oak tree transplants we need to put in the ground. So first let's talk about this heat wave that we had last week and kind of the impacts of that. And then we'll get into more of the watering. Now, it gets really hot down here in the summer and it's really humid, but it usually doesn't start until maybe towards the end of May where it's just, you know, suffocating humidity outside here. But last week, we were getting into the low 90s, I think a couple days we got close to the mid 90s, and the humidity was really, really bad. It was just stuffy out here. I don't know what the humidity percentage was but you could definitely feel it and we could see that our plants were feeling it as well now these squash here which are just now starting to put on fruits were probably the thing that was suffering from the humidity and the heat the most last week these leaves you come out here last week in the afternoon and the heat of the day were just kind of wilted and folded over they weren't dead but man, they were suffering, you could tell. And they had water on them because we've got drip irrigation below these plants. So we were giving them plenty of water, but they just weren't used to that heat and humidity yet. They're folded over a little bit today, but not near as bad as they were last week. Now summer squash obviously is a warm season plant and it can take the heat and the humidity usually just fine when it's used to it. The problem was last week, is it got way hotter and way more humid than it had been being really quick towards the end of last week and these plants just weren't used to it and they were suffering a lot it's kind of the same thing that we get in the fall when things are warm out here and we get a real cold spell all of a sudden and a frost can really bite back the plants because they're not used to the cold weather yet so when we get unseasonably warm weather this time of year it can make the plants suffer and we just have to keep a really close eye on things and make sure we give everything plenty of water so it does survive which leads us into the water discussion now i've said this before and i'll probably say it many times again i have a much better garden with a dry spring versus a wet spring. That may not be the case for everybody, but with the way I do things, the setup, the equipment I have, the way I garden, a dry spring is always gonna make a more productive garden for me than a wet spring. If we have a lot of wet weather in spring, that's gonna cause a lot of weeds. So I'm gonna to have to work extra hard to keep my weed pressure at bay keep weeds from going to seed and creating problems in future years. Also, our disease pressure is gonna be escalated in a wet spring. The more leaf moisture we have, the more disease problems we're gonna have in this humidity. So, in a dry spring, I can water the plants with the drip irrigation where I need it. I'm not watering all the spaces in the garden, so I can keep the weeds under control. The weeds don't thrive as much and then the diseases obviously aren't near as big of an issue because most things are on drip we're watering at the roots not on the leaves so yesterday which was friday we got about a half inch of rain depending on who you ask at the local breakfast joint the any rain we had before that was the previous friday so yesterday was the first rain we had had in a week and couple that with all that warm weather last week we really needed it before we got the rain the previous Friday, we had went two or three weeks without any rain. So I've been watering steadily around here, basically watering every day. With the 10 plots I have, I can't get them all watered in one day. So I have to run water every day just to keep all 10 plots happy. Now, if you've only got one or just a few plots and you go through a dry spell, your best option is probably to actually water just a little bit 
every day just to keep the plants nice and happy like i said i can't water all these 10 plots every day there's just not enough time in the day to do that so my goal with these 10 plots i have is to water almost every plot at least every other day now one of the exceptions to that every other day watering schedule would be our taters here and we do overhead water our taters but taters just don't seem to need as much water as other things we grow in the garden yes we want to make sure the plants don't look wilty we want to make sure the plants stay looking happy but i can usually even in some pretty intense heat get by with watering these once every three days or so and so about every three days i'll take one of those little green tripod sprinklers we have and usually run it for about i'd say two two and a half hours on my taters and that's been plenty enough to keep them happy even with the heat we've been having now for the other stuff it's a little more thirsty than we do have on drip we're watering that every other day and i'm usually going at least two hours every other day as far as how long we're letting the drip run but for some things we do water longer than others so for example these tomatoes and peppers here they're getting about two hours of run time from the drip system every other day assuming no rainfall so how do we know that two hours is long enough well it's just kind of trial and error until you get it figured out with this drip tape that's down here when it moistens the soil we'll see kind of a dark ring around these plants this soil looks light now because it's already dried up after that rain we had yesterday but if i were to turn on the drip now after a couple hours i would see kind of a dark ring of moistened soil around these plants and the first few times i've watered these i just kept an eye on it and seen that it takes about two hours for me to get that ring around these plants here so i know two hours will sufficiently water these now with those tomatoes over there that have pine straw around them and same case with the eggplant and peppers here i obviously can't see that water ring around the plants because we have straw in the way but i know that if two hours keeps these plants happy i'm getting some extra water retention by having that straw there so two hours should be plenty for those too so it's just trial and error figuring out for your garden your soil type it will differ by soil type if we had heavier clay soils we probably wouldn't have to water as often with these sandier soils they drain really well but they don't hold water really well and so we have to water more often than if we had really heavy soils so like i said two hours of drip run time every other day is pretty much good enough for most everything we have growing this time of year except for this corn here now when this corn is small like it is now two hours is probably good enough but corn is one of those things where it can really really soak up the water especially in our soils that drain so well and so with the corn i'll run it for a lot longer I'm usually running on the corn even when it's small like it is now for say four hours at the time sometimes i'll come out here at 10 or 11 o'clock at night turn it on the corn and not turn it off till six or seven in the morning and it soaks it up just fine we're not getting super saturated soils by any means doing that so it just differs from crop to crop corn is one of those more thirsty crops so we can afford to run the water longer on it so i said all that to say this there's no one size fits all solution as far as a watering schedule for a backyard garden it's going to depend on a lot of things can depend on what kind of plants you have planted some plants are more thirsty than others corn is more thirsty than tomatoes and peppers are it's going to depend on your climate down here the humidity can really really suck the life out of plants if you're in a northern climate it might not be as bad and the plants may not suffer as much in say high 80 90 degree weather and then you've got soil type obviously our sandy soils don't hold water near as well as clay soils do so you got to kind of add that into the equation as well so in a wet spring when we get a lot of rain there's not a whole lot we can do about that we can't just come out here and throw up a bunch of high tunnels to create all these controlled growing environments we just have to deal with the excess moisture and know we're going to fight the weeds more know we're going to fight the plant diseases more but in a dry spring like we're having down here this year we have things in place to help us out like the drip irrigation and if you can 
do drip irrigation on your garden if it's feasible for you i would highly recommend it there's so many benefits to it we're saving a lot of water you know reducing that weed pressure and also the plant diseases a lot of people ask why i don't have many weeds in my garden it's not because i'm out here every day weeding i really only weed these plots probably once a week and when we're going through these dry spells i don't even have to really run through the entire plot with a wheel hoe we'll get one or two weeds popping up there between the rows i'll come out there and just pluck them out by hand or take a stirrup hoe and just kind of do some spot weeding so the drip irrigation is going to save you a lot of time across the board if you can implement that in your garden so now that we've covered the watering situation we need to thin out these zipper peas a little bit and then we've got some oak tree transplants over there that need to go in the ground so talked to you a couple videos ago about our trials and tribulations with getting these zipper pea seeds to germinate we realized that the first time we planted them they didn't come up well at all because we overwatered them so the second time we didn't water them much and they came up really nicely we planted them super thick because we want to ensure we get a good stand so today we want to come in here and thin these out to about one plant every i'd say two to three inches or so we still want to leave them in there planted thick because we want them to kind of bush out and vine out in these open spaces between the rows here i know it looks like i've got these rows far apart right now and have a lot of wasted space here but with them planted thick like this they will climb out and when these things are full grown there shouldn't be hardly any bare soil in here should cover the ground and help us a lot with weed suppression as well so when i'm thinning like this if i've got several plants real close to one another like this i'll just pick kind of the strongest looking plant of the bunch and leave that one chunk the rest of them if i've got one here that's kind of out of line like this guy i'll get it out of the way or like that guy get it out of the way and we'll just come through here I'll just kind of chunk these on the soil. That looks pretty good there. Two to three inches between those. Scoot down here. We'll leave that one because it's a little taller. And we'll just work our way along and get them thinned out. All right, so we got those thinned out there. I didn't do that second double row. I kind of left that for comparison's sake, although I don't know if you can tell a huge difference because those plants have gotten bigger. But that will definitely help. Some people will say you don't need to thin these at all. You can plant them real tight. I do like to thin them a little bit because what can happen is I get so much foliage that it's hard to find the peas. They get all kind of twisted together in them vines. So thinning them out just a little bit is going to make harvesting a little bit easier down the road. So now let's mosey on over here to the end of this plot. Skip over these rows of peas. Skip over this row of peanuts. It's starting to fill in a little bit there. And we've got about four foot of space to work with which I saved for them oak tree transplants right there now we do a decent amount of trials here amongst the 10 pots we have comparing different varieties of crops we do a lot of tomato trials we do some pepper trials things like that but one of my favorite things to do is oak tree trials comparing all these different varieties of oak tree now I haven't even come close to growing every oak tree variety out there but I've grown quite a few probably somewhere between 20 and 30 different oak tree varieties over the years. And I just like seeing the different growth habit of them, seeing the different production levels, seeing how long the pods stay tender. There's so many differences between oak tree varieties and it just really interests me looking at them and comparing them. Now, when we were growing our produce to sell, when we were market farming, the variety I grew the most of was jambalaya. And I will stick by this, that, that is still the most productive oak tree variety I've ever seen. And so because that variety made us more money, we grew more of that variety than anything else. Now that we're not growing oak tree to sell, I don't grow jambalaya really anymore. It is also the itchiest variety of oak tree I've ever seen. It would cause me fits, not necessarily this time of year when it's still a little cool, but in the middle of summer, picking that stuff in August, man, it would sting me up and make me itch like the devil. So we don't grow jambalaya anymore. We're more focused on trialing some of these heirloom or rare varieties. And I've got quite a few here that we're gonna try in our first planting this year. We'll probably do several plantings of okri 
as we normally do but our first planting is going to include Gold Coast, Bradford, Jade, Vex Big, Stewart Z Best, Eagle Pass, and a dwarf bush longhorn oak tree. So we got seven, I think, maybe eight varieties here that we're going to try, and I'm really looking forward to comparing them all. Now, this is probably the latest I can remember planting oak tree here at Lazy Dog Farm. Usually, we're harvesting oak tree by now. But this year, I've just spent so much time and energy focusing on these tomatoes, especially these indeterminate tomatoes with this new trellising technique we've got that I haven't put a lot of emphasis on my oak tree. That's okay down here. We've got plenty of warm months to grow plenty of oak tree. We can grow it on into November down here. So we'll still get plenty of oak tree to eat. We're just a little later on planting than we would normally be. The soils are warm enough now, I could probably direct seed oak tree and get just fine germination, but I did grow these out as transplants in the greenhouse. So this is what we're gonna be sticking in the ground today. Now, as we've grown all these oak tree varieties over the years, there are certain traits of an oak tree variety I like, and then there are certain traits of some varieties that I don't like. And this is just my personal preference. Everybody out there has got their different things they like about certain oak tree varieties. So for me, I like an oak tree variety where the pods don't get tough really quick. So the pods can get on out there six, seven, eight inches long and still be nice and tender. That means we get more oak tree to eat per harvest. And it also means we don't have to harvest as frequently. Some of those varieties like jambalaya, although super productive, you gotta pick them every other day, if not every day sometimes, because once they get longer than say four inches or so, they will get tough. So. The last couple of years I've been leaning towards more of the varieties that stay tender at longer lengths. And the other thing I really look for is plant height. So some varieties of oak tree will get tall as a skyscraper real quick like, and especially with our way of growing them where we kind of prune the lateral limbs as we harvest just to make things a little easier so our oak tree is easier to find. Some of the varieties don't really like that, or maybe it's not that they don't like it, but it makes them get really tall. And when an oak tree plant gets eight or nine foot tall, yeah, I can pull on that stalk and bend it over and grab the oak tree. But when they get real tall like that down here, I'll just take my loppers, cut them down, plant some more oak tree somewhere else. So I like a variety that doesn't get real tall real quick. That way it's still easier for me to harvest them. And I'm sure there are one or two varieties like this that I'll be planting today. I've never grown any of these, so I don't know what any of them are like. But I'm usually not a huge fan of the short, fat oak tree varieties. So things like Star David, we did the Alabama Red last year. It's kind of a short, fat oak tree. They tend to get tough pretty quick. They look neat. It's kind of a novelty thing, in my opinion. But you're not getting a whole lot of oak tree per harvest, and so I don't try to grow those varieties. I'll grow them in a trial and compare them to other ones. But most oftentimes, once I grow one of those short fat varieties, I usually don't grow it again. Now, oak tree plants are pretty drought tolerant. They don't usually need a whole lot of water. They can survive the summer heat pretty good with just some water every three or four days or so. So they should do just fine in this plot with these field peas, which are also drought tolerant and the peanuts, which are not super thirsty, and we'll just water them overhead, just like we're doing the rest of the stuff in the plot. Now, the one big difference in planting oak tree versus anything else we grow is the fertilizer. Now, with almost everything else we plant, we always put down some form of pre-plant fertilizer in the planting furrow, but I don't want to do that with oak tree. Now, I have done that with oak tree. I've messed up and forgot that kind of rule I have a few times in the last couple years and what happens is the plants look beautiful but they get on up there three or four foot sometimes before they make any pods so oak tree it seems like that doesn't make pods you don't get some real good pod production until that plant is starved a little bit if you give it a lot of fertilizer a lot of nutrients you're just going to get all oak tree leaves and not a lot of pods so I'm not going to put any pre-plant fertilizer down before we plant this oak tree, and I'm not going to fertilize it at all. Now, we do have a little bit of nitrogen in the soil because we had our chicken tractor on it this past winter. Hopefully, that doesn't have too much of an impact on these oak tree plants here. But I usually don't fertilize oak tree at all. Just let it go. If it starts looking real, real pitiful, I might give it a little side dressing or something or pour a little agri-thrive alongside those plants. But most often 
no fertilizer at all on the okra and for me and my gardens that's the way to maximize production so let me add a little addendum to that from my experiences before we make a furrow and plant these okra transplants so that jambalaya variety that we have grown a lot of doesn't seem to be bothered by some fertilizer and by that i mean even if we would fertilize it, it would still start putting on okra pods at 18 inches, 24 inches tall, and it would seem just fine. And it seemed to respond well to a little bit of fertilizer throughout the year. But most of these heirloom varieties that we've been growing lately, if you fertilize them too much, it's gonna take a long time before you start getting pods. If you starve them a little bit, you'll get pod production a lot sooner. So some people will say, well, this variety wasn't very productive for me at all but think about how much nutrients you were giving it. If you were given a lot of nutrients or there was a lot of nutrients in your soil, that could have been the reason you weren't getting pod production as early as you should have been, at least with some of these kind of old school heirloom varieties. All right, so one row of okra going in right here. No drip tape, no pre-plant fertilizer. That makes things pretty easy. All we need to do is make a little furrow. We can put our transplants in. So we got our transplants laid in the furrow there and for most all of these varieties we're going to do a one foot spacing because we'll prune these as they grow so they don't need a ton of space because we'll be clipping those lateral limbs as we harvest okra. I did give myself a little bit of gap between varieties just to kind of make that distinction. But down here at the end the one variety that we are spacing out a little bit more would be this dwarf bush longhorn okra. Supposedly this variety, you're not supposed to prune it. You're supposed to just let it bush out because it is a dwarf, smaller, compact plant, whatever you want to call it. So I went three to four foot spacing on the few transplants we have of this variety. And I've got my planting map here. I'll put this on the computer later. That way we know how many transplants we have of each variety. And boom, just like that, our okra is finally planted. Now this soil is still a little moist from that rain we got yesterday, but this wind today has it drying out pretty quick. So I'll probably have to put some water on these tomorrow. Once they get roots established, they'll be pretty drought tolerant. We won't have to water them that often, but at least until those transplants establish, we'll probably have to give them some water every say two to three days, probably. So that's our first oak replanting. And then our second oak replanting, which will probably come say maybe July, maybe even early August, we're gonna plant a decent sized part of that Ruiz okra so we can grow out another seed crop of that and share it with some of you guys that wanna try that variety. If you're interested in our previous or wanna see our previous okra trial results, you can just go to our channel page on YouTube and search okra up top or you may have to use the incorrect spelling, O-K-R-A. Either way, search that and you should see those videos pop up and you can see which varieties that we grew last year that we liked and which ones we didn't like. And if you want to join me down this heirloom okra rabbit hole, I would highly recommend checking out this book right here. It's got a lot of historical information about okra. I met the guy that wrote this book. He's a really cool dude. It's got a lot of okra recipes in it, a lot of information about these different varieties of okra and pictures of each variety. Really good stuff in here. I'll put an Amazon link below if you're watching on YouTube. You can grab a copy of this if you haven't read it yet. I've read it once and I might read it again now that I'm all fired up about okra once more. And let me know in the comments below what your favorite okra variety is or what your favorite okra varieties are. If you've done any trials recently, please do share the results of those experiments. And if you've got some varieties you think I should try that I haven't tried, definitely list those in the comments as well. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to check out all our affiliate links below. A lot of great companies that we use in our gardens here at Lazy Dog Farm. Even got some coupon codes for some of those companies so you can take advantage of those discounts. Don't forget to go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where we've got our garden blog with several of the results of these oak tree trials over the last year. We've got recipes, recommended products, hats, shirts, all kind of good stuff over there. If you did enjoy this video, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification button, like, and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm.